it's great to have the community behind this and let's see looking forward to um, discussing um a big thank you to sabrina poirier for what uh, she's done um as being a massive contributor in the myalgic encephalomyelitis space um, with the CHR broadly and the CHR Institute of Muscular School of Health and Arthritis. Um, I first got to know Sabrina um, with her work with what is now the ICANN CME network and Dr. Muhert's going to talk about that. Um, thanks to being such a great advocate for patients, being so educational um, and educative for me uh, personally, Sabrina. And my closing comment is that I was aware of ME as a condition well before I became the scientific director in 2017, because I'd been a musculoskeletal doctor and uh, in a clinic where we had challenging patients, as it were, you know, medical term for people with chronic problems referred. And so people had often seen five, six doctors before they saw people in the clinic that I worked at. And I had seen patients with mitochondrial myopathies, patients with unexplained um, you know, fatigue. I'd seen the epitome of um, patients with what we now would diagnose as ME, but we weren't using that term back in the early 2000s and, and even before that. And so when I became the scientific director, this idea that is ME real or not, and it's embarrassing to use that term even in air quotes, was not an issue. And so I was able to say to my colleagues who were skeptical and colleagues in various places, we've got to move on from it's real. Like it is real. Now the challenge is to find um, diagnostic criteria. The challenge is to find treatments. And we really, really need to validate patients' experiences. And I remember saying that at the launch of the ICANN CME in Montreal in October of 2019, and you know that the video is there. It's like it's time to move on. It is real. Validate the patient's experience. That's an important first step. Be humble as a doctor and say, I don't have all the solutions. You know, I don't know what's causing your pain. I don't have great treatments, but we're moving on, and hopefully we'll we'll be able to stop saying that. But in the first instance, don't be hubristic and say, you know, this is your problem. This is not the patient's you know imaginary problem. This is real. And from there, I'll hand it over to Sabrina. Well, thank you very much, Kerm. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, I am going to read from my notes because I'm a little cognitively uh, tired at the moment, and so I apologize for that. Uh, so first off, thanks to Kerm and to the IMHA team for collaborating on this with Nina and I. Um, our community is suffering from a very serious and debilitating um, multi-system illness, and we appreciate IMHA using its platform to really raise our voices and to really give platform to Dr. Nina Muirhead, who's going to share a lot of information with us today and her insights. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Muirhead. Um, she's my friend and collaborator on several different initiatives, um, and we've been working together closely this year. She's a surgeon, a researcher, a medical educator, an Oxford graduate, and an individual living with ME. She's also a valued member of our I Can See ME working group on trainee development and medical education. Um, so we're really thrilled to have her. She brings great knowledge and insight to every conversation and we're really making very meaningful progress, I think very quickly. So we're really proud of that group. Um, and before I pass it over to her, I just wanted to give a quick note on terminology because this tends to come up when we do ME webinars. Um, so the World Health Organization recognized ME over 50 years ago as a neurological illness. We will be mostly using the terminology ME during this webinar, but in research, many of you might be aware that ME-CFS is a common term, and sometimes this illness is known by chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS. So if you hear that or see that on the slides, that's mostly because we're quoting research, um, but we'll make every effort to use the terminology ME going forward. So with that, I'll pass it over to Nina. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Sabrina, for the introduction, and thank you, Calm, for the opportunity, and a big thank you to the CIHR and the IMHA. So I'm going to go through diagnosis and management of ME, the connection between ME and long COVID, and current and upcoming research. So myalgic encephalomyelitis was formerly known as chronic fatigue syndrome and often is still referred to as CFSME, as Sabrina already explained in research articles. It is a devastating, chronic, complex, multi-system disease. Myalgic stands for muscle pain, and the inflammation of brain and spinal cord is termed encephalomyelitis. There are over half a million sufferers in Canada, and there's a female preponderance similar to other autoimmune diseases, such as multiple sclerosis. It affects both children and adults, and there are two peaks of incidence 
one in the 30s and 50s and the other in adolescent age. 80% are triggered by a viral infection. 40% have a first degree relative with an autoimmune condition. And interestingly, it crosses all ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and it may even be more common in some of the ethnic minority groups, but there is not enough research showing that. There are some small papers on that. Prognosis is unknown and possibly only up to 5% recover. The figures are slightly better in children and adolescents. So I'm very excited by the I Can See Me initiative. I'm fortunate to have met Alain Moreau in 2018 before this all began. Um, and it is fantastic to see this unique combination of clinicians, patients and researchers all coming together to collaborate because we are in a unique position with this illness that patients really do get a significant understanding of what is going on and often bring more to the table than in any other um, disease areas. And it's really important to hear the patient voice throughout the journey with this disease. I have been fortunate to see some of the wonderful research that's going on in Canada, and I'm hope, hoping that there'll be many more uh, upcoming webinars as well. Um, and as part of Sabrina's group with the tr trainee development and medical education working group for I Can See Me, I hopefully um, really help push forward some of the education initiatives we're also doing over in the UK as well, especially with the change in the UK guidelines put forward by NICE, which is the UK National Institute of Care and Excellence. So I'm doing quite a lot in research um, and particularly with the education side of research. I'm the chair of the UK MECFS um, Research Collaborative. And I'm also uh, with Sabrina on the working group in the States um, for the Center for Solutions in the US. I'm also in contact with many of the professional members of the Euromine group in Europe and other people who are interested in education and educational leaders over in Australia and New Zealand. So I have quite a, a large network of um, friends and collaborators who are all interested in improving education in the topic of ME. So why me? So my background is completely different. I'm a um, skin cancer surgeon. I trained in Oxford and I love teaching and training, and I'm already a um, university tutor for the postgraduate diploma of dermatology. And then I got sick. Um, so having never believed in or understood the disease particularly well, but having come across a few fibromyalgia patients during my orthopedic surgery, I didn't really understand ME um, and just was, sort of of the belief that maybe patients became a little bit disheartened, deconditioned um, or demotivated. But so I went into this illness, having had the infectious mononucleosis, the Epstein-Barr virus, thinking I'm not going to take to my bed. And then I got really seriously, very significantly unwell with multiple multi-system symptoms and I had to stop work in March, despite trying to exercise and continue and push my way through it. I ended up bed bound for well, six to nine months and then 18 months in a wheelchair. And I still have a disabled badge and I'm still only able to work probably about a third of what I could do before I got sick. And I have to have a lot of help and a big network of support to enable me to do that. So this was me in the months before I got sick, um, skiing, cycling, doing my diploma of dermatology. And I have wonderful countryside where I live in England on the outskirts of London, where I usually do a 10K run. And all of that came abruptly to an end after I got sick. So I was 36 at the time, started with high fevers, sore throats, feeling flu-like, 
But then I got increasing headaches, facial, vein, facial pain, vomiting, sinusitis, muscle twitching, diarrhea, flu-like symptoms, difficulty even climbing up the stairs on my hands and knees, dragging myself up to the top of the stairs, feeling out of breath and short of breath. I would get chest pains, pains across my back, atypical chest pains, abdominal pains, cramps, diarrhea. I was hypersensitive to smells, chemicals, light and noise. I had tinnitus, dry eyes at night, dizziness, stumbling. Anyone would think I was a hypochondriac with this list. Walking into doorways, numb hands and fingertips. I needed to sit or lie down, even in public places. I would just sit on the high street um, because I just couldn't stand up for any longer. I had word finding difficulty and problems with my short term memory. I kept burning things, leaving the bath running. It was actually starting to get very dangerous. And I also had a new skin rash. I saw 13 different doctors before I had my diagnosis of ME. And within five minutes of walking into my current GP's office, she said, I know exactly what you've got. You've got ME. It is quite serious. I know two other patients who are really quite severe. And the fact that she took me seriously and treated me with respect and compassion and believed what I was saying was overwhelmingly reassuring for me, even though it was a devastating diagnosis to get, because that belief that I had something and that it was real was really important to me. I had quite a lot of different investigations. My blood results were generally normal, apart from the um, Epstein-Barr virus. And I did also have a new diagnosis of postural tachycardia. My heart rate went up to 140 just on standing after about nine minutes. I was started on an antiviral. Um, that was a little bit of luck. I actually got the real flu within uh, a year of getting the ME diagnosis and was quite unwell with it and was put on an antiviral for the flu. And my ME got so much better on that antiviral that I persuaded the neurologist that I was then seeing to keep me on it. And I've been on it for 22 months and it helped enormously. I also had B12 injections, bed rest for about six months, um, good nutrition, but often you're not well enough to cook for yourself. I was fortunate in that my parents took me back to their house and nursed me and my mum prepared all my food. So I had a large network of a huge amount of support. And I'm very, very grateful that I am lucky enough to have had that and to be able to be here today talking to you because without that, I wouldn't be as well as I am. Not that this support made me better. It's just that I'm one of the lucky ones and my disease isn't as severe as some. So having had that life experience of this horrendous disease, I realized that doctors don't really understand it at all in general. Most hospital doctors do not know what ME is. This is a serious disease with fluctuating multi-system symptoms, which can cause a major impact on function and quality of life. It is not well understood or diagnosed by the profession. Exercise and cognitive exertion exacerbate the disease. Even concentrating to try and read something would exhaust me for a day. And severity and relapses are not caused by thoughts and feelings. And we see that in other disease. Many of our psoriasis patients with a skin condition have a flare up of their skin and they've done nothing wrong to cause that flare up. It's the same with ME. We can be doing everything we would normally do in a week and suddenly it will hit us out of the blue and we've done nothing to cause it. So it's not thought, feelings and behavior that control this disease. It has a mind of its own and the best we can do is stay within our means in terms of energy. So what makes ME difficult to diagnose? 
There are no reliable biomarkers. There are no consistent clinical signs. There are signs. A lot of patients have levido, which is like a, a, a vascular pattern and pooling of blood in the feet. They often look pale. They sometimes have pupillary defects. Babinski sign, the neuro, neuro foot reflex is upgoing, but it's not consistent and you can't make a diagnosis based on it. It's a heterogeneous group of patients. So some will be ill with a virus, others will not know what caused it or triggered it. It might have been either an asymptomatic infection or it could have just developed out of the blue like other autoimmune or chronic conditions can arise for no reason whatsoever. Patients present with a long list of overlapping symptoms. They will often just attend with one complaint of pain or one complaint of um, feeling unwell. And it doesn't really give the whole picture of how debilitated they are in their daily life. And different body systems are affected to different degrees in different people. Some will have more gut symptoms, some will have more heart symptoms and so on. And there are many different um, sorry, I can't read that. Definitions of diagnostic criteria. So the ones that I find easy to teach are the Canadian Consensus Criteria and the IOM, but there are many other different diagnostic criteria and there are several papers which cover those. I'm going to try and keep it simple today because we don't have much time. So I'm just gonna go through this CCC, which from, originated from 2003 and they have been updated. And this slide really nicely summarizes them quite briefly. Um, the cardinal feature is post-exertional malaise. And when I first read about that, I thought that a person had to do proper exercise like a, a, a marathon or a sprint to trigger that. And in fact, it can be something as simple as brushing your teeth or ha having to concentrate on a conversation with a friend for a little bit longer than you would normally. And that will be enough to trigger post-exertional malaise. Sleep dysfunction, which can be difficulty getting to sleep, feeling exhausted when you wake up, and also having lots of dreams as well. There's cognitive and neurological symptoms, which can be sensory or to do with thinking and planning and concentrating orthostatic intolerance or irritable bowel or heart problems. I had all three. <laughs> um, body temperature changes. A lot of people find that difficulty keeping their body temperature constant. Um, so very hot and very cold can really take a lot of energy to regulate your body temperature. Um, a lot of people have high fevers and a lot of long COVID Patients are explaining that they're getting these sort of chronic high fevers. I presented with high fevers. Appetite changes or even change in being able to eat at different times of day uh, can occur. Immune sy symptom syst symptoms, fatigue, muscle pain, joint pain, deep bone pain um, and headaches are all part of that. So this really does cover quite a lot of the different symptoms. The other one that's nice and easy to teach is the IOM, which is more recent. They just go through the four categories. Do you have impaired function? Must be moderate to severe and frequent more than half of the time. Post-exertional malaise, which we've already mentioned and I'll go through again on the next slide. Unrefreshing sleep and then orthostatic intolerance or cognitive impairment. What we're finding is that in clinic, people haven't been looking for orthostatic intolerance, but when they start to look, they're picking it up in over 80% of patients with ME. So what to ask the patient? The patient won't walk in and say, I've got post-exertional malaise. They'll walk in and say, I, I'm not well, I'm having to change what I do. I can't work all the time. I'm having to take annual leave to try and get my work done. They will have every other explanation, but 
they won't necessarily be able to tell you they've got post-exertional malaise. So the questions that might draw it out mm. are what fraction of your pre-illness capacity are you functioning at? It may be different for mental or physical. I'd say I'm about a third of my mental capacity, but maybe only a tenth of my physical capacity. And what could you do before being ill versus now? How many hours a day or a week can you productively do useful things um, is quite telling. So when I was very ill, I probably had one productive hour a week. Um, that went up to eight with the antiviral, it went up to 30. So, and it's still around 30, <laughs> um, but it really does help understand how the person is functioning week on week. How many hours a day are your feet on the floor is really interesting as well. Most people it's 14 to 16 with ME patients, it's often under 10 and sometimes as few as half an hour. What happens when you engage on previously tolerated levels of activity, both physical or men mental? Sometimes it's a few days afterwards when people feel um, exhausted or ill, they can feel headachey or like they're coming down with another sore throat or flu. Do you avoid change or change in certain activities because of what you do after them? They may be subconsciously avoiding things that will trigger post-exertional malaise without even realizing it. And what can or can't you manage on a good or bad day? How long does it take to experience symptoms and to recover? after physical or mental effort. And it doesn't really matter what the answer is. I think it's more of making a note of what their personal experience is of this disease. So I did some qualitative research um, led by a medical student who interviewed some patients about what they went to their GP with. And none of them said fatigue. Some had pain, others said they felt flu-like, but I've put some of the quotes up here because I think it's really interesting. One said I was too ill to continue, I continue working and functioning as normal. Another, I got flu, then went back to work, then started getting pins and needles and other strange symptoms. I couldn't go to work, it was like getting the flu. Things can sometimes hit me for days or weeks at a time. I was working, but I was starting to feel really ill. I was pushing through and then one day I decided to jog back home from school. The next day I totally collapsed and felt I was dying. I thought I was slipping away, I felt so ill. You feel ashamed that you can't live your life the way you want to. My neck would get really stiff, tremendous headache and a fever. Or a description of feeling horrendous and then saying the next time it happened, I thought, oh, well, I didn't die last time. I kept going to the GP and saying, I'm not well, I'm not well. Or I had pneumonia and I wasn't getting better and I wasn't getting better. So these patients are expecting to get better. They're expecting to be well. They're expecting to be able to get to work and yet it's not happening and they're wondering why. Communication can be difficult for the patient, particularly if they're getting problems with short-term memory and will often have to write things down. And if you're finding that you're having a consultation with a patient and they're not able to explain what's wrong with them, then arrange another appointment for when they do have time, when you have time and ask them to write everything down and also maybe to bring another adult with them. Because often whatever you say to them, they won't necessarily be able to remember because they have memory problems, brain fog, cognitive and processing issues. And it can re really cause quite a lot of distress in that sort of medical encounter to even just get the message across of what, how ill you feel, especially when um, you've been minimizing it in your own mind before presenting to the doctor. Often patients have to travel a long way, especially if they're going to see a specialist and that can exhaust them for weeks or even months. So waiting in the waiting room, um, even getting up at a different time for the appointment can 
put tr tremendous stress on a patient who has very little energy capacity and the symptoms they can experience can be enough to put them off uh, returning to a medical encounter. So routine blood tests and tests for orthostatic intolerance should be started as a part of the basic workup. The tilt table test is not offered in many places across Canada um, and it's not always accessible in the UK either. So within the clinic itself, the NASA 10 minute lean test is a perfect way of picking up uh, orthostatic intolerance. You get the patient to lean against the wall so they're not using their calf compressors and also so they don't faint or collapse on you. You, you take repeated heart rate and blood pressure and make a note of them. If the, you can also diagnose postural tachycardia um, using the NASA 10 minute lean test. If there are any focal neurological signs, um, it's really important to rule out anything else going on like multiple sclerosis or a space occupying lesion. A lot of practitioners wait to rule out serious things like MS or um, other sort of lymphomas and, and things as a cause of tiredness. But I think it's really important to say to the patient, I suspect you may have ME, particularly if they're coming forward with this post-exertional malaise, because they need to then go back and tell their employer, their family, this is one of the things that the doctor is thinking about so that they can prepare themselves for how they're going to manage. And also so they don't push themselves out of it thinking if they could just pull themselves together, they wouldn't be sick. It's important to have regular checkups to ensure that there's nothing new emerging like anemia or a thyroid problem that can be treated. There's a handout that Sabrina, Sabrina will put in the chat um, from the clinic, Clinician Coalition, um, and that includes many, many um, 20, 30, 40 different um, differential diagnoses that can actually be either associated or diagnosed at the same time as ME. So they're not necessarily differential diagnoses. So I have POTS, fibromyalgia, and ME. Um, and there are many patients with several of these. Some of the sub diagnoses are treatable and it's really important that they are treated um, rather than everything just be put down to ME. And other symptoms such as pain, sleep disturbance and orthostatic intolerance have treatments as well. So take a good history make a diagnosis, manage the symptoms. With medications, people can be really hypersensitive. A lot of patients who used to be able to drink and tolerate alcohol as normal can't. And it's very similar with medications as well. They become very hypersensitive. So start with really low measurements, start low, go slow. It may be that the first few weeks they're on the medication, they're still recovering from the consultation where you prescribe the medication and they're worse. It's not necessarily the medication, it could be the post-exertional malaise from attending. So wait for it to kick in, see if it's working before adding in or changing anything. Consider the severity and also if they may need uh, someone else with them to help with communication and also physically getting to the appointment. Arrange suitable, regular, appropriate follow-up and also help with disability paperwork. It took me three weeks to fill in mine and it was exhausting and I nearly missed the deadline. And it, the whole experience is horrendous because you have to admit to yourself how sick you really are. And advise the person to rest and pace. So in the UK, we've got some exciting new guidelines coming up and the draft has given us a clue that um, exercise will be removed from the guideline. So this is actually taken from the draft guideline, all of these points, and they are one after the other. Do not offer therapy based on exercise. Do not 
offer generalized physical activity or exercise programs do not offer specialized graded exercise therapy. Um, and importantly, some of the more alternative approaches such as neuro-linguistic programming, lightning process, there, there's also very, very little evidence and they're really not recommended for this disease until we know more. We need to do much better, more scientific, uh, rigorous research to know what the right treatments really are. So moving on to research a little bit here. Um, why is exercise harmful? Well, I always thought exercise was good and I wanted to exercise my way out of this, but it turns out that it does make you worse and it makes you worse at a cellular level. So your ability to have a workload and to use oxygen with your cells is worse the day after exercise. And in every other patient with pretty much every other disease, uh, even um, either people who are deconditioned or other people who have other disease who can exercise their way out of it, they get better physiology the day after exercise. ME patients get worse. So there's also evidence of neuroinflammation in the brain and increased inflammatory cytokines. Exercise can often exacerbate cognitive symptoms and that can be for up to a week afterwards. So we're starting to look in the literature at objective parameters such as workload and VO2 max and the aerobic and anaerobic threshold, which shows that our bodies are not coping as well the next day after exercise with that exercise when we repeat it. So this disease is not secondary to deconditioning and reconditioning is not a treatment. It's a huge paradigm shift in the whole understanding of the illness. Uh, summarised quite nicely with this research published about a year and a half ago, which shows that your cellular fitness and your lactate levels, um, your fitness deteriorates when you've got ME, um, when you repeat the exercise 24 hours later. The other research that's happening, a very exciting call at last week with Alan, um, who spent some time showing what else is being done in Canada. He's looking at the whole system um, in terms of, rather than doing research just on the bit he's specialized in and being a, in a silo, it's picking up what is post-exertional malaise? Can we model it? Can we do it without making the person worse? Using questionnaires that really focus on, this is the DePaul questionnaire, on actually the level of post-exertional malaise and the symptoms the person is experiencing. Looking at parameters like heart rate and then picking up special um, signalers, cytokines, brain oximetry, which is showing that brain oxygen is usually less in MECFS patients and also micro RNAs. And they did publish that 11 different microRNAs specifically associated with things like connective tissue, neurology, mitochondria are all being affected and they're significantly different in ME patients compared to controls. This is another study by a different group, um, not in Canada, but it just shows what's going on in the world around us. These patients were shown to um, have different levels of severity. So they tested 82 women, 31 mild, 31 moderate and 20 severe. And they had them do exercise on the first and the second day. This was very low level, low grade exercise, but it was enough to show that the second time they did it on the second day, their VO2, their ability for the cell to use oxygen and their workload both decreased and it was significant. But not only that, the patients who said they were severely unwell and less able to do the exercise 
were more unwell and less able to do the exercise. And all those parameters were significantly different as well. So it's good numbers and it really does show that if the patient says they're really not well, they're really not well. The people who are severe are not acting like they're more severe than the people who are mild. They are actually more severe. The other thing um, that there's a few of the same authors in this group, um, they looked at a hundred severe patients. Now these were all severe and they made a note that even just on sitting tests, 86% had orthostatic intolerance and 90% had reduced cerebral blood flow. So there was less oxygen getting to the brain. And that was significantly different to healthy controls. And I think it's really important that we make the point that patients are lying down because they feel that ill. Um, if you go to the COVID wards or A&E when it was bad, everybody was lying down in the corridors. Nobody was standing up. Um, so these people aren't ill because they're lying down. They're lying down because they're ill. There's also some really good evidence of widespread um, increase in lactate. So we can all put lactate up in our muscles by cycling away or, or going for a um, little bit of exercise, but no one can really think so hard that they push their lactate in their brain up unless they have some other space occupying lesion or, or, or maybe like a tumor or something. However, in ME patients, there is widespread increased um, lactate up to four times normal. Um, so this is a really significant finding and it does show that there is neuroinflammation. Quality of life of ME patients compared to other significant and chronic disease like chronic renal failure, rheumatoid arthritis, which has a lot of pain, um, diabetes. I mean, these are severe, significant, recognized life-changing illnesses. And here you can see the quality of life at the top, MECFS, the lower the score here, the worse their quality of life. Um, and this is published now quite widely in the literature. There are probably a dozen or more papers showing that quality of life is reduced in MECFS. And if you look at the data more closely, particularly in comparison with other neurological disease like MS, it's the physical health that is most impaired for ME patients. It's not their mental health. They are perhaps a little bit more depressed or anxious, but not in comparison to other people with other disease. It's they're physically more sick. This is um, some research that I've been involved with. So this is looking for the first time at the impact on family members' quality of life. Now, I do recognize that a lot of patients are too sick um, to even meet people or have a family, and some have lost family members, and there are many people who are isolated and alone with this horrendous disease. Um, and that really needs recognizing. But for those whose family have stuck around, there is a huge impact. And here, the higher the bar, the greater the impact. And we showed in the publication just um, January this year, that ME has a major impact on the lives of both patients and their family members. And it's almost double what we were observing in other papers on um, cancer and 25 other chronic diseases. And this is using the same validated questionnaire, the family reported outcome measure from 16. And we're now doing an international study on the same subject. And we're looking at the family impact on patients across the world uh, on their family members. So Sabrina, hopefully you'll put a link for that as well if you want to take part. So in the UK, we, we are moving away from graded exercise therapy. I'm conscious of the time, so I won't go through this too detailed, but this is a direct quote from the NICE patient survey, which shows that 
all these patients who wrote a written response showed that they were made worse by exercise. There are medications to try. So for sleep disruption, a lot of people already have been doing all the best things they can, nice dark room, quiet, removing screens and so on um, for good sleep management. But melatonin and low dose amitriptyline can help some people. I think it's always wise to try things and work with the patient um, and make a note of what they do get on with and make a note of what they don't get on with so they aren't then re-offered the same thing when they have a flare up uh, and given retried on something they didn't suit them before. So keep working with the patient on what suits them. Fludocortisone, Vabridine, Midodrine and other beta blockers are very good for orthostatic um, intolerance and also tachycardia. For pain, you really need to be cutting back on what you're doing because obviously you're getting a lot of pain and if you're still doing nothing, then there are options including no, low dose naltrexone and Tylenol and non Patients are really desperate, they can have opiates, but there can be breakthrough pain from opiate withdrawal, which I don't think is good. Um, and in general, vitamin supplementation, B12, vitamin D, and a good healthy um, diet to gut microbiome, and these means as well, if there's a mast cell activation, crossover it can also be very helpful and there are references there so will long covid lead to me is the million dollar question um <laughs> when the pandemic started a lot of me patients said oh, we're going to get so many more people from from long covid and we are seeing it there are obviously a lot of other complex organ problems and there are patients with post-COVID um, depression as well and it's really really important now more than ever to be able to differentiate between these patients and what is really going on. ME clinicians who've been seeing ME patients for a long time can see similarities in the long COVID patients coming in and interestingly they are seeing one or two that have differences and they can see it straight away because they're used to seeing this disease now. Um, it's the general medical profession who are still catching up with, with even knowing what how to recognize ME and differentiate it from depression and anxiety that is the real issue here. Um, we do expect a subset of long COVID patients to develop post-viral ME. And in Canada, this may be tens of thousands of people, unfortunately, just on the basis of how many people have tested positive and the number of deaths. Um, the study um, with the diagram here was a seven month review of long COVID patients uh, from the body, body politic group. And we got permission to share this um, from Hannah. She shows that as would you would expect with a very severe illness, a lot of people have a protracted prolonged recovery up to three months and they're just slowly getting better. But what's really interesting here in this diagram is this purple band of patients who are not only not getting better, but they're starting to increase their numbers of symptoms and fatigue and post-exertional malaise are featuring those. And I think this is a really, really interesting patient cohort to watch over the next year or two and see what happens. And I do suspect up to half of those or more will have ME. And from the same group, the list of symptoms almost perfectly matches the diagnostic criteria that I mentioned before, with the most common being fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, neurological problems, headaches, memory issues, insomnia, muscle aches. I mean, that's the diagnostic criteria for ME, isn't it, really? So it's going to be teasing out of these patients who has and who hasn't got ME is the next challenge. 
finally, here we are, summary. Thank you for listening. ME is a complex multi-system heterogeneous condition and it's fascinating. It's probably one of the last unsolved mystery, medical mysteries of the 21st century and here we are um, talking about it. So that's exciting. Um, there is a post-exertional flare in symptoms and exertion can be even trivial things. The neuroimmune exhaustion is pathognomonic of the disease. The severity of the symptoms can fluctuate hour to hour, day to day, month to month, year on year. And patients present with a long list of overlapping symptoms and they affect different people in different ways. There is an opposite physiological response to exercise. Management needs to be tailored to individuals and patient harm can occur following failure to recognize and diagnose it and wrongly giving advice to do graded exercise or even telling the patient to ignore their symptoms. They've often ignored them for far too long by the time they present. So then being told to ignore them some more can be very harmful. Recognition, information and support to friends and family, as well as employers, can be really, really helpful. And if they're at school age, telling their school nurse or um, teachers can be immensely helpful for them understanding and supporting the child. An early diagnosis, rest and disability support can reduce morbidity. Can't wait for a biomarker because this will get astronomically interesting after that. Um, and I think we're getting close. You know, long COVID has brought the world smaller. We're sharing big data. We've got artificial intelligence on just exponentially growing, improved imaging, neuroimaging, um, more information on epidemiology and a whole new cohort of people with, with long COVID to study as well. But what we mustn't forget is compassion and empathy when we meet a patient with this horrendous disease. And thank you. That's it. <laughs> Do I stop sharing? Yeah, I think that's uh, probably probably good. And feel free to flick back to a slide if you felt that would really help. But I'm going to pass over to Sabrina um, to lead the questions and the co-hosting here. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Nina. That was fantastic. Lots of great information. Um, our first question is from Dawn Richards, who most of us in the MHA community know really well. She's wonderful, um, a great champion for patient engagement. Her question is, what advice do you have for those of us in the patient and research community who wish to be allies for our ME colleagues? And she says, I know that sounds vague, but what do you advise of, of us in terms of being more supportive and helpful? And I can jump in on this one too. What do you think, Nina? Do you want to ju jump in first, Sabrina? Sure, so we had this question from um, another person as well, uh, Peter, and uh, I thought about it for a few minutes. So I think one of the things that's most important is just amplifying existing voices. We have some wonderful advocates in the community and because our community is uh, varying degrees of ill, some of our advocates are literally advocating from their bedrooms and from their beds on that one good hour that they get a day. So to be able to amplify those voices and really you know, support what they're saying is so important. So if you can do that, that's tremendously helpful. Um, often we'll have campaigns or initiatives where we're looking for volunteers. So if you wanna help more than that and you wanna really engage, there's so many wonderful opportunities to work with us. So just ask, reach out and ask. I've put my contact information in the um, chat and uh, I'm always open to receiving messages on Twitter or by email. And uh, yeah, just asking the question at different times in, in the year will get you a different answer. <laughs> Nina, do you have anything you want to add to that one? Uh, yes, so I've been amazed at how helpful patients have been in supporting uh, medical students that I've been working with in the UK. So anything from a short answer on an online email all the way to having an interview with a medical student has enabled the student to really understand the disease but also has enabled them to build a profile of what patients would like doctors to learn about the illness. And I think that if you can 
if you have very little energy but would like to do something, I think helping to educate um, on whatever scale you can uh, would be a phenomenal way of, of helping out or even sharing a short um, narrative or, or video that can be shown to medical students or even trainee physiotherapists or occupational therapists. They don't have to just be um, doctors. They can be across the um, specialties. Fantastic. So the next question is from Barbara Fifield, who's a wonderful advocate in our community. We're very thankful to have her. Um, she said, I can see this webcast would be a wonderful resource for patients to direct to their Canadian physicians, especially with the CIHR, CIHR endorsement, uh, which gives it automatic credibility, which is desperately needed. Will this video be posted on the CIHR website? If so, when? Carm, I know you answered this, I think, in the chat, but maybe you just want to jump in and share a little bit more. Sure. And uh, thanks, just to kind of thanks to everyone um, for being here. Let's... Um, make sure that the recording has come through. It looks like it's recording on Zoom. So um, all things being well, you know, let's get behind and share it widely and share snippets of it widely. Um, so folks can, folks can offer places where they can promote it. And this gets to Twitter and as a community, us driving traffic. Like let's say we post it somewhere, that's one thing, but everyone on this community using their voices in different channels going, here's a great uh, video. Um, will add to the reach. And so um, there are different communication channels for the whole community, which um, Sabrina might be able to mention for Canada. Um, so I will stop there, but also draw Sabrina's attention to the question about cl clinical help in Canada. Not everyone can queue up to see Dr. Muirhead. So Sabrina, do you want to touch on what you advise? Because you've had you know, literally thousands of people asking your advice about appropriate clinicians. Yeah, and that's a really tough one for us in Canada. So we have three clinics that um, work specifically in chronic illness. Um, they're learning about ME and, and, you know, trying out some new things. And we're really thrilled about that. I think we can build on that capacity and build on that knowledge. And I think there's some really exciting work in the next year ahead. Um, our working group is also doing a lot of work to try and educate physicians as quickly as possible. Um, so we're working, I'm working personally with some medical students, we're working with some one-on-one uh, -on -one back and forth with some doctors who are showing some curiosity and some interest. So there are really hopeful things happening. They're not happening fast enough and they're not going to be the kind of thing that's gonna happen overnight. But those three clinics have very long wait lists. So we always encourage patients to get on the wait list right away. One of them is in Halifax, one is in Ontario and one is in BC. Um, I, can, uh, I can certainly follow up um, and post a little message um, in the um, chat. But I would say get on the waiting list as soon as possible, but go into that with um, realistic expectations because there is no cure and there are no approved treatments. So what we're trying is really trial and error. And uh, you know everybody's still learning about ME in Canada, so it's still early days. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, I wanted to go to one of the other questions. So is there anything that can be done to lower the risks of ME, Nina? That's a tough one. I think um, it, it's bad luck if you get ME uh, and it's not necessarily that you've done anything wrong. Often we're seeing that in 80% plus it's a viral trigger or trauma. Um, so if you have gone through emergency surgery or had a, a very bad burst appendix or you've had coronavirus or anything else that's sort of really depleted your immune system, then you must rest uh, out of it, especially if you have that family history of autoimmune disease. As I said at the start, about 40% have a family history and also any personal family history of ME. So if you've had a previous glandular fever infection, maybe when you were, you were a teenager, um, those things can increase your risk. So early resting and pacing following uh, an infective or a traumatic insult is really important in those early stages. Later on, I think it is slightly luck more than judgment. If you've got a really supportive network and you're able to rest and recuperate like a trauma patient would, 
then you've got half chance of, of rebuilding some of your pre-illness capacity. Um, but I, I don't think people who, who are still sick decades after first getting sick did anything wrong to, to cause their disease profile to be severe and prolonged. I, I think it's more complex than that. Okay, um, one of the questions that was submitted early um, was what does fatigue mean in practice? Is it just tiredness or is it different than that? So I know you touched on that, but it may be good to just kind of go back and just touch on the idea that we're tired. Um, it's just not accurate. So can you talk a little bit more about that? So describing ME as fatigue is a bit like uh, describing a leg amputation as breaking a toenail. Um, it, it's a total underestimate to the point that it, it, it really does not describe the disease. So I was so tired that I couldn't find words. I was so tired that I couldn't cope with someone being in the same room as me. I was so tired that I, it, it's crushing tiredness. It's like you've been run over um, uh, and it is total neuroimmune exhaustion. And I think that's the better way of, of describing and understanding it than just fatigue. Everyone feels fatigued. No one feels crushed that I, they can't speak or think. And maybe just one final question, just given the time um, before we wrap up. Has there been any genetic predispositions associated with ME that have been studied or reported in the literature? So I know that this is being looked at right now and studied, um, but can you talk a little bit more about that? There are many, many anecdotal family reports where grandparents, parents and children have got the disease or many children, um, which has caused a lot of problems because then they start looking at the parents and thinking, what are you doing to these children? Why have all three of your children got ME? Um, so it, there is definitely some genetic predisposition. And I think the biggest evidence that we've got to date is the um, 500,000 UK biobank um, entrance um, uh, and a big study in, in the US as well, where they're seeing um, if people have got inheritance for insurance claims. Um, and they said that based on those massive, massive numbers, it is likely that there's a genetic component. But what we really need is the actual evidence. There have been a few small studies, but the one that we're excited about is the Decode ME, Decode ME project in the UK, which is looking at 20,000 patients and finding out what the genome-wide association is. And there are likely to be a handful. And then once we find out what those things are coding, we can then look into more why it's gone wrong. Um, very complex. Very. So as we pass over, before I pass it over to Kerm, um, I want to draw attention to the chat. There's a few people who've posted their personal um, experiences of what um, ME feels like. And uh, I think it's worth reading that if you have a few seconds. I know we're talking at the same time, it can be tricky. Um, I will attempt to maybe um, encourage them to do that again on Twitter for those who follow on Twitter so that they can read them if they've missed them today. But I think those descriptions are really apt and really uh, accurate to what we always hear. Um, before I pass over to Kerm, I just want to thank again Kerm and the IMHA team for doing this. Um, you know, collaboration is really important. We talk about it a lot, but it's really nice to be able to see that in practice. And we certainly very much appreciate using the platform this way and giving us this opportunity. It's tremendously meaningful. Um, I wanna thank Nina very much for sharing her knowledge, insights and her personal story. I think it's really brave to do that. There's still a, little, a lot of stigma around this illness and especially for medical providers who are suffering with this illness. They often don't wanna come forward. And so you're very brave and very wonderful to do that for us. Um, and so sort of a final note, there's no cure, there's no treatments um, that are sort of approved. Um, and any treatments that do help, help a little. Um, so we want to be really mindful of that, that when we're treating patients that we're being kind and compassionate, as Nina mentioned, um, 
and that we're being realistic about our expectations. Not everyone's going to recover, even if they do everything right. There are going to be many people like Nina and I who remain ill, and it's not for lack of trying. Um, so please do understand that. And let's work together to increase investment, research. We want robust and objective research, and that's you know a costly endeavor, but it's an important one. And let's support our healthcare providers to learn more so that they can diagnose and provide support faster and really minimize the harm that's caused to patients. Um, we can't battle this alone. So we're gonna need all hands on deck and everybody at the table. So, you know, we need and support um, everybody joining us in this endeavor. So if you wanna help out and you wanna follow up or you have any other questions, please do um, reach out to me and I'd be happy to find you the answers um, that you need. Thanks so much and over to you, Carm. Thanks very much, Sabrina. Thanks everyone. So um, I just wanted to um, just mention a couple other names on the on the on the call today. I mean, it's always tricky mentioning names because you're not mentioning some people. But um, I own a warden Driscoll from the ICANN CME team. Um, Simon Deckery, uh, Hilary Robertson from BC, Christiana Garcia from Quebec. Scott Simpson, Jeff Smith, of course, and there's others, you know, forgotten there, but this is um, this community working incredibly hard uh, to help each other. Um, my deal is to say that uh, at CHR, we acknowledge that it's real. We're looking for solutions. Um, we will, you gave us a good list of action items, Sabrina. They're all realistic. Um, we've got increased capacity. We've got increased awareness. So um, this is a massive step in the journey, in a journey. I think uh, people will be really grateful for you, Nina, um, for putting this out there um, as we build forward. But we need to aggregate you know, information like this in one place at a time where there's misinformation. Um, and so that leads me just to promote the Tim Caulfield um, webinar coming up um, that you'll get through the sources. You got this, but he's going to talk about misinformation and this question about the vaccine. Like, should we have the vaccine? There's so many questions. We can bring that up um, there as well. You know, what about the vaccine um, in this? But maybe given the vaccine, how important it is Nina? I will just ask you to give your thoughts on that because you will have thought of that. And so, if people need to drop off, we won't be offended. Um, but Nina, why don't we close with your thoughts on the vaccine um, for patients with ME? So I think if you have the opportunity to have the vaccine, take it. Um, patients with ME should be categorised as a neurological disease. It's been so by the World Health Organisation since 1969. And you do have a compromised immune system. So if you can have the vaccine, expect that it may knock you a, um, a bit for a few days, like a vaccine would, like a flu vaccine, or maybe a little bit worse than that. So don't plan to do anything, expect a bit of post-exertional malaise, but get vaccinated because it's so much better than having COVID. Thank you very much. And so In the UK, um, a lot of patients are. Fantastic, yeah, thank you. And you were saying before the call, 15 million people have been vaccinated in the UK, so it's a good sample. It gives us all confidence. So um, I'll close. Thank you, Sabrina, for your work on um, this webinar and your work consistently. Um, so um, thanks very much for everyone for being part of it. And um, let me know how I can help, let Sabrina know how we can help. And thank you so much, Dr. Nina Muirhead. <laughs>